Greetings, everybody. Welcome. I'm Cindy Davidson, the Education Trustee for Silo Foundation. And today we are delighted to be hearing from Megan Walker of uh, Blue Skies uh, Forensic Meteorological Services. I'm going to have to say the word meteorology like <laughs> 10 times, and I'm probably going to mess it up a lot. So, uh, Megan, just, just hold tight. I'll do my best. Okay. <laughs> Um, we're going to be talking about forensic meteorology. Megan is a certified consulting meteorologist and the founder and chief meteorologist at Blue Skies Meteorological Services. She earned her master's in atmospheric science from Purdue and her bachelor's with honors from in physics from the University of Tulsa. She's an expert in forensic meteorology, which you probably didn't even know was a thing, right? <laughs> until, until this week. Climate, extreme weather research, operational meteorology, sustainability, natural hazards, mitigation, and emergency management. Megan has taught university level physics and meteorology and is a frequent presenter on the topics of climate change, environmental science, and sustainability. Today, Megan will share updates about the pros and cons of automated weather algorithm products, and we will understand the value of reconstructing past weather conditions and how that data can be applied to claims investigations. We have an hour, and although you are all on mute, sorry about that, we will take questions through Q&A, and I'll keep an eye on those as they come in. Please let us know if you're having any technical issues. We'll try to help you out, and with that, I will turn the program over to Megan. Thank you so much, Cindy. So yeah, so for those of you who have not heard of forensic meteorology, I tend to describe it as weather CSI. So what a forensic meteorologist does is reconstruct past weather conditions and their impacts. Primarily, we do work in the insurance industry and also um, for legal cases where weather was a factor. So that's the majority of my work is with severe local storms impacts, um, hurricane impacts, that sort of thing. So the first thing, that I want to talk about. Well, actually, this is my, my creds. But Cindy did such an excellent job that I don't think we need to linger here. What I really want to get at today is more what is the difference between what an automated um, product or an automated hail report or an automated wind report can offer you in terms of reconstructing past conditions versus what um, an actual uh, forensic meteorologist or a professional can offer you, because there's differences in these approaches. And the way we're going to get at this is um, some old school television. So I don't know if you all remember the AmeriQuest commercials from, it's probably been a decade now, um, but the idea here is really context and nuance and discernment. So with that, I'm going to give us all a couple of, of belly laughs before starting. I'm sure of the NFL. Oh, beginning. There we go. Yeah. Yeah. America was more. <laughs> all right, so this is always awkward when I can't see whether you all are laughing, but I'm I'm gonna hope that you all are laughing along with me on that one. So the idea here is that an algorithm, so whether you're talking about an automated hail report or an automated wind report, and hopefully most of you are familiar with these products. If you work in the insurance industry, I'm, I'm sure you've seen them. You've been, um, you've either pulled one of these reports yourself, I mean, the CoreLogic, Risk, or some of the bigger names in this industry, or perhaps you've had um, a client bring you one of these reports, perhaps they were provided with one of these reports by um, say a roofer who came to inspect their property. And so these sorts of reports can be really useful, but they also have some pretty significant limitations. And the main limitations are kind of what that AmeriQuest commercial was getting at, is that they, these automated products, these algorithms, they don't necessarily have the ability to look at context. They don't have the ability to, to look at nuance. And so that's really the big difference between using one of these products versus working directly with a forensic meteorologist or professional meteorologist. And you don't always need to be working with a professional meteorologist. On some cases um, or, or claims, and we'll talk about what type, you know, you can use these products. They can be useful for you. So what we're going to talk about here is basic meteorology first, just understanding hail, how hail is produced aloft in a thunderstorm, and then 
you know, what determines the size of that hail when it reaches the ground and what determines where it reaches the ground. And then we need to talk about the tools that we use to detect hail. So radar is the primary tool. Um, that's what I as a meteorologist use. I look at other data sources as well, but radar is a really powerful tool for this. And radar is also what these algorithms are using when they're trying to detect hail. So we'll talk about how does the radar detect hail? How is it used to estimate the size of hail? And then what are some of the limitations and uncertainties? Because all tools have limitations and uncertainties. So we, before we, we rely on the output of an algorithm, we need to understand what are some of those constraints um, that are part of the input, in this case, the radar data. And then we're gonna dig into these algorithm-based hail products. So how precise are they? How accurate are they? And you know, when do you wanna use these products as part of your, your claims investigation and evaluation process versus when do you wanna get a second opinion? And I'm focusing on hail um, primarily today because that's, there's actually more science behind hail algorithms than wind algorithms. If we have time at the end, uh, I'll, I'll dig in a little bit into sort of wind algorithms, what is, there is to get into, um, and then also discuss some of the, the data sources that we can use to, re, uh, a meteorologist can use to reconstruct wind. But for right now, we're gonna focus more on the, the hail side of things. So meteorology first, science first. Um, the size that hail ultimately grows to aloft in a storm is determined by the amount of time it spends in the cold upper below freezing regions of that storm. So in order to grow really large hail, you need an intense sustained updraft that pushes hail way up in the atmosphere where it's very cold and it spends a lot of time cycling up and down, up and down, up and down in that cold upper region of the storm. And to get that, you need a lot of instability that gives the energy for a really strong updraft. And you need wind shear, which basically pushes the, the updraft um, slightly on its side and it separates the updraft and the downdraft, which means that that downdraft of cold air and rain doesn't choke off the updraft and allows the storm to keep turning and keep growing larger and larger hail. On the ground, oh, environmental conditions play a big part into the size that hail um, has when it ultimately reaches the ground. Because, you know, hail is a thunderstorm phenomenon, right? And thunderstorms tend to happen in the spring, summer, and the fall. And so the freezing level um, is warm, right? It's warm on the ground. The freezing level is somewhere in the atmosphere. And so if the freezing level is quite high, right now I'm in Florida, our freezing level is probably somewhere north of 15,000 feet, which means if hail were produced in a thunderstorm today here in Florida, it would have about three miles of falling from below the freezing level before it hits the ground. And that can create a lot of melting. If a storm has, is not very uh, strongly tilted, if the hail is mixed in with a lot of rain, that'll also increase the melting of the hail as it, as it falls from the hail production zone in the top of the storm to the ground. And then finally, if you have a decent amount of wind shear, you can end up with size sorting, which is basically where smaller hail is blown farther than larger hail. I don't know why it's not playing with me today. All right, so the algorithms. The science behind these algorithms is basically all the same. So whether you're talking about an algorithm that's used operationally by the National Weather Service or whether you're talking about algorithms that have been developed by private companies, they're all relying on the same basic data. They're all pulling data from the National Weather Service network of radars. In this case, their technical name is the WSR-88D. You probably hear them call, uh, called NEXRAD radars. And these algorithms, they can incorporate dual polarization data. And we'll talk in a little bit about what dual polarization data is and what it means for the ability of an algorithm to detect hail or for a meteorologist to detect hail. Um, and these algorithms may also incorporate on the ground storm reports. So the good news is that things are pretty cheap and easy and they're, they're easily accessed. If you have a credit card in five minutes, you can pull one of these automated um, weather reports, automated hail reports, online and have it in your hands. They can also generally identify areas of interest. So they can generally identify if a strong thunderstorm capable of producing hail was in the general vicinity of a property on a given day at a given time. The bad news is that an algorithm is a fixed approach, right? You're relying on a single fixed algorithm to describe a wide variety of situations. Thunderstorms that develop during different seasons, that develop during different uh, in different parts of the country, and so a fixed algorithm is not going to be able to accurately um, describe and perfectly describe 
such varied situations. And what that leads to are type one and type two errors. So a type one error is, uh, well, you can see down here where the doctor is, is telling this um, older gentleman that he is pregnant when he clearly is, is not pregnant. So that would be a type one error. So for the, the hail algorithms, that would be the algorithm saying there was hail when in fact there was not hail. And a type two error, which is, slight, is, is a bit more rare for these hail algorithms actually, is where the algorithm misses that there was hail altogether, where the algorithm says there was not hail, but in fact, hail was falling and reaching the surface. So those are sort of understandable, right? Any tool is going to have pros and cons. It's going to have strengths and it's going to have limitations. But where these automated products can get kind of ugly, and this is where we can get in trouble, is when uh, they falsely represent their accuracy and their precision. So a lot of these products will put out really beautiful looking maps with tidy little lines that are very smooth. Um, they'll indicate you know, hail sizes down to say a 10th of an inch. But the reality is that any detail beyond what the radar, the tool itself that's producing this underlying data, any detail beyond what that radar detects is going to be interpolation, not actually detection. And the radar's not, able to detect everything. The largest hail may not fall where the radar presentation is the most impressive. And radar can't, well, it can't see what it can't see. So once hail falls below view of the radar beam, um, the radar is not able to estimate how that hail is, is, is melting. And uh, that algorithm that relies just on radar data is not going to be able to um, account for these below beam effects. Also, an algorithm is a human product, right? So small changes in the algorithm can actually produce really big changes in the output, even for a single algorithm. There's a, a big difference. Algorithms from different companies can vary significantly about uh, the very same event at the very same location. And then finally, private companies understandably want to protect their intellectual property. So when they develop these proprietary algorithms, they're not exactly opening it up for peer review by scientists and third parties. And so we're basically left to, to trust the company about the accuracy of their products. That said, um, we may not have good peer reviewed data about the accuracy and precision of these proprietary algorithms, but we do have really robust data verifying and validating um, algorithms that are used operationally by, say, the National Weather Service. And so since all of these algorithms are bringing in the same base data from you know, radar data and they're operating on the same principles, they're all using really similar strategies, by looking at the validation studies for these operational algorithms for which we do have peer review science, where we do have verification and validation of their accuracy, we can use that to learn something about the probable limits and accuracy and precision of these proprietary products. So as is a little bit later um, in this presentation, we're gonna look at those um, verification studies. So, so what is the promise, right? I mean, so this, this graphic that you're seeing here is taken directly from one of the major national um, companies that provide these reports. And the reason that I was harping on, you know, false representation of accuracy and precision is because what's being promised here, um, is not necessarily something that can be delivered, that the science can deliver. So what you see here is what looks like structure level precision, right? There's like baseball size hail um, right over this house, but there's no hail at all, just a couple of blocks away. And you know, precision, the size of hail is 2.8 inches in diameter, not 2.7 or 2.9, but precisely 2.8. So this begs the question, if this is the promise and this algorithm is ingesting radar data. Does the radar data itself support these sorts of claims? And so let's talk about that. Let's talk about what the radar can do. Radar is our best tool for remotely detecting hail. But as, as I said before, all tools have constraints and limitations. And two of the biggest constraints and limitations with radar is that the resolution decreases with distance. That in the same way that if you turn on a flashlight, that flashlight beam spreads as it moves away from the flashlight itself, a radar beam spreads as it moves away from the radar. In fact, it spreads about a thousand feet for every 10 miles of travel. And what that means is that it's never gonna be able to resolve a single house 20 miles away. It also means that the radar loses resolution. It loses the ability to detect detail farther from the radar. 
And as that pixel essentially is getting larger and larger and larger, you can see it on the screen, storms that are far away from the radar will tend to get averaged out with their environment. So small storms can actually look less intense um, as they, when they're farther away from the radar. The radar beam also increases with height above the earth um, as you move farther away from the radar. And so what you see down here in the second image is that the radar beam passes straight through the precipitation core, the heart of the first storm, but because it, it, pull, it rises away from the ground, although in reality it's the earth moving away from the radar beam, but you know, extra detail, um, the radar beam increases in height above the surface of the earth as it gets further away, and it actually passes over the precipitation core of that second storm. So the end result here is that storms far from the radar will appear less intense. And so what you're looking at in this graphic is the exact same line of storms at the exact same time from two different radars. This line of storms impacted southeastern Oklahoma, and that top image is coming from the radar in Fort Smith, Arkansas. And if you look at where the arrow is pointing, those storms don't look that bad, right? I mean, I would drive through that without a second thought. But if we switch to a closer radar, which is what you're looking at in the second, that bottom panel, that's the radar out of Oklahoma City. And suddenly those storms are here much more intense, also more detailed. The reason why is that the radar beam from Fort Smith, that upper image is actually passing over these storms. And so when a radar, when an algorithm is looking for hail, which is produced in the core of a thunderstorm, um, the distance from the storm to the radar matters and whether that algorithm is looking, um, is ingesting data from different radar sites also matters because one radar is not necessarily going to tell you the entire story. Um, and some locations are far from all radars. Uh, places here in Florida, there's, there's parts of the country, Texas, Oklahoma, um, Arkansas, Missouri, especially out west, out in the mountain west, where there's just not good radar coverage. And that, that's a problem um, if you're relying on a radar estimated hail size over a location where the radar coverage is just not very good. And the radar, the radar can't see everything, right? And I mentioned the beam you know, increases with height above the surface of the Earth. And so the radar can't see what's happening below view of its beam. Hail can melt on the way to the surface. It can get blown horizontally. And as I mentioned before, you can have these size sorting effects as well. So there's a lot of limitations, right? That makes radar sound like a terrible tool, but it's actually not. It's, it, there, and there have been significant increases to the capability of radar, especially within the last 10 years. So let's talk about some of the good stuff that we can get from radar. Starting in 2001 through about 2013, the National Weather Service upgraded their, their network of radars to what's called dual polarization mode. So, Prior to this upgrade, radars were only sending out horizontally polarized beams of energy. And so we were only getting a view, a horizontal view or information about the horizontal aspect of any particles of precipitation that that radar beam encountered along the way. With dual pole, we're adding the vertical. So now we're sending out, the radar sending out a horizontal beam and a vertical beam. And by comparing those two, we can actually get really detailed information about the different types of precipitation within a storm. So with dual pole, we get three new variables. The first is called differential reflectivity, which is basically just looking at the shape of what's technically called a hydrometeor, but it's basically just a particle of precipitation, whether that's rain or hail. So differential reflectivity is looking at it, is it round, like say a hailstone, or is it oblate? Is it like a flattened you know, ball or a frisbee? Um, Raindrops, when they get large, tend to get flattened out like that. So if you see a signature indicating a round, circular, spherical particles, that's more likely indicative of hail. If you end up seeing something that's a lot wider than it is tall, that's more indicative of rain. We also get correlation coefficient, which is looking at the diversity of precipitation within a given volume of sky. So if you have low correlation coefficient, you have a mix of precipitation type, maybe hail, small raindrops, large raindrops. If you have high correlation coefficient, you're looking at something a lot more uniform. And then finally, specific differential phase is looking at the amount of liquid water in a given volume. So with all of that, what we're looking at is a classic hail signature is going to be high reflectivity. So a lot of energy is being reflected back at the radar. There's a lot of 
something out there doing the, the reflecting with low differential reflectivity, so something that's more spherical, and low correlation coefficient. So indicating that there's hail mixed in with rain, because often you'll see um, hail doesn't usually fall only by itself, although that, that's not always true. Um, so that's the classic hail signature. It's most reliable for large hail. It gets less reliable when you start looking at smaller hail, hail that is melting, or hail that is mixed in with a lot of rain. So there's a lot of overlap between different precipitation types, and that's another major challenge for an algorithm um, approach. So I'm going to give you the punchline first. The bottom line is that algorithms can generally identify areas where hail is being produced a lot in a storm, and they may be able to roughly estimate the maximum hail size on the ground, but they don't do a reliable job of giving a precise hail size estimate at a precise location. So that said, there are two different strategies um, that algorithms can employ to locate hail and to estimate its size. The first looks at storm structure. These are older algorithms. They don't rely on dual polarization data. What they rely on is what we talked about at the beginning, the fact that a strong, a deep, robust updraft leads to larger hail. So what these um, strategy one algorithms are looking for is a tall, deep, precipitation core within a storm that extends well into the hail growth zone, well, well into these uh, below freezing temperatures a lot. The second strategy uses the dual polarization data. So it's looking for that dual polarization signature that indicates hail or rain hail mixture, especially close to the surface. These strategies, they can be combined, but both of them uh, maintain inherent uncertainties. So first we'll look at the um, storm structure. So strategy one, what you're looking at here is the mesh algorithm. It's the maximum estimated size of hail algorithm that is used operationally by the National Weather Service. And so when you're looking at this, this figure here in the bottom left, that background image is the algorithm output. So where you see light blue, that's where the algorithm estimates you know, small hail, less than one inch diameter. Where you see darker blues um, and darker greens, that's where the algorithm, or darker blues through greens actually, where the, the algorithm is estimating severe hail, so hail between one to two inches in diameter. When you start to get into the yellows, that's where the algorithm is estimating what's called significant severe, or hail greater than two inches in diameter. And then these little circles are actual hail reports. So the way that this study was done is that you had um, the research scientists and an army of student scientists where after a storm rolled through an area, um, these scientists would get on the phone and they, instead of waiting for a report to come to them, which is what normally happens, they were proactive. They got on the phone and they called and they said, hey, a big storm just rolled through your area. Did you get hail? And if you got hail, what size hail did you get? And so they were able to get a really high resolution um, data set of confirmed hail reports. And so that's what you're seeing with these little circles on the top. So where you see the little red circles, we're talking about uh, no hail. So this is where they called someone and said, hey, did you get hail? And the person said no. Green circles are sub-severe hail, hail less than one inch diameter or less than quarter size. The little blue circles are severe hail between one and two inches in diameter. And then these purple circles are significant severe. So hail that is more than two inches in diameter. And so the thing that I, I want to point out here is that the algorithm estimated hail larger than two inches in diameter was being produced aloft in the storm. And hail larger than two inches in diameter was verified and observed on the ground. So the algorithm correctly estimated the maximum size of hail that was being produced by the storm. Where we start to get a little less rosy is when we start to dig into the details. This algorithm also um, estimated small hail where significant severe hail was observed. So you can just kind of see the bottom of this purple circle up here at the top of the image. That is a report of hail larger than two inches in diameter over an area where the algorithm estimated hail of about 0.5 inches in diameter. So that's a pretty big discrepancy. Small hail was also observed in the heart of the storm. 
where significant severe hail was predicted. And we have no hail at all observed beneath a portion of the storm where the algorithm estimated, again, hail over two inches in diameter being produced. So this begs the question, if the algorithm was able to correctly estimate the maximum size of hail being produced, why are the locations off? And the reason for that is that this algorithm is is evaluating what's happening aloft in the thunderstorm. It's not actually looking at the surface. Again, the algorithm, the radar can't look at the surface. So hail can be melting as it falls to the surface. It also takes time for hail to reach the ground. So a thunderstorm will start producing hail aloft before hail is actually evident in reaching the surface. And also hail can keep falling towards the ground even after the storm is no longer actively producing hail aloft. So we can take a, a look at what that would look like using this example. So stage one is early in the thunderstorm's development. It's now starting to produce hail aloft. That hail has not actually started to fall back down towards the surface, has not started to reach the surface. In stage two, a little later on, that hail starts to reach the surface. And so the algorithm sees hail being produced aloft and the observations of the surface match. Um, we start to get reports of hail on the ground. Stage three, the thunderstorm starts to weaken. The updraft weakens. The precipitation course starts to fall back towards the ground. So you'll end up with a, a radar estimate of not as much hail or not as large hail being produced a lot because that core has descended. It's starting to, to collapse. But you'll still have a large volume of hail falling towards the surface and reaching the surface. And then stage four, the core has fully collapsed. Hail is no longer being produced aloft. The algorithm is not detecting hail aloft, but you can still have reports of hail on the ground as that hail continues to fall below beam and reach the surface. So that's strategy one, that's looking at storm structure. Strategy two is using this dual polarization data. So what does that look like? This is a, a, an evaluation of what's called the hail size discrimination algorithm. This is a, um, an algorithm that also is used operationally with the National Weather Service that ingests dual polarization data. And this study was designed the same way as the previous study. So um, the, the research scientists, after a, a hailstorm moved through, they made phone calls and said, hey, look outside your window. You know, can you tell me the maximum size of hail that fell? And these three panels are output from the same algorithm, the same HSDA algorithm, with one threshold or one parameter, the differential reflectivity parameter, that's been tweaked. And so I wanted to show you these three panels to show you again that small changes in the algorithm itself can result in big changes to the output. So up here, the threshold is, is set fairly high. So the sensitivity is fairly low. And well, first I want to point out in all three cases, the algorithm predicted giant hail and giant hail was observed. So where you see, um, in this case, they actually thoughtfully color coded the uh, the verifications, the observations with the algorithm output. So where you see a pink circle on top of a pink pixel, that means that the you know, giant hail was observed where the algorithm expected giant hail to be, at least in the lowest levels of the storm. And where you see, you know, uh, say over here, you see a pink circle on top of a purple pixel, that is where the algorithm um, expected large hail, so less than two inches in diameter, but hail larger than that was actually observed. So as we, we go down this line, we're, we're changing that differential reflectivity threshold. And so when the threshold is high and the sensitivity is low, you end up with those type two errors where the, rate, the algorithm is actually missing where giant hail is falling. But if you take it too far, you end up with those type one errors. So if you look at that bottom panel, the algorithm here is overestimating where giant hail um, would be anticipated. And so again, like with that mesh algorithm, that structure-based algorithm, this one is correctly identifying that giant hail was being produced in this storm. Um, but it's again, not getting the locations exactly correct. Also small changes in the algorithm in result in large changes to the output. And another thing I wanted to point out for those of you who are familiar with these sorts of, of hail reports, um, what you're seeing here is the base data. So these large pixels, that's what's actually getting ingested into the algorithm. That's what the radar itself is actually 
um, detecting. So when you see those tidy, smooth lines, just remember that's interpolation. That's not actually measurements coming directly from the radar. So the bottom line, again, is that these algorithms are useful. They produce useful information, but they are not, they're not gospel. <laughs> Um, the storm environment is incredibly complex, and the tool radar that underlies these algorithms has its own detection limits. So what does that look like in action? What does that look like for, um, say, claims evaluation? So this is from a case that I was on a few years ago. This was a large commercial loss. Um, by the time that I was brought on the board, there were multiple carriers. Uh, multiple attorneys already in place, and the period of interest was spanned a full 10 years. So when I came on board, um, several of other parties that were involved had pulled some of these automated hail reports, and I was, I was basically given a copy of them and said, here, take a look if you want, it might help. So the first thing I did was put those away because I didn't want to be influenced by, by the algorithm output, and then I, I went ahead and I performed my own evaluation. But after the fact, I pulled those three reports out and took a look, uh, both because I was curious to see where they agreed or disagreed with my own evaluation, and because I knew uh, that in those places where I disagreed with the algorithm, that's where I would most likely be called on to, to justify my own conclusions. So when I, I pulled these three algorithms out and I, I you know, compiled all the data and ran a comparison. And what I found is what you see in front of you, which is a kind of complicated graph. But what you're seeing here is all the dates when one or more of the algorithms indicated hail during this 10 year period. And, and we're not talking about, you know, we're not, I'm not running any sort of uh, filtering, just any hail will do. So on 22 days, one or more of these algorithms indicated hail of some size within three to five miles of the property. So all of these green bars are the different algorithms. The dark green is core logic, the mid green is weather guidance, and the light green is Verisk. And then the blue is my own assessment. So 22 days when one or more of the algorithms indicated hail, on only eight days did all three algorithms agree that there was hail. Not even that they agreed that there was hail of a certain size or within a certain size range, just only eight out of 22 days when all three agreed that there was hail within three miles of a given location. And on two of those days, there were false negatives where basically one or more of the algorithms missed the fact that there was hail. So what does that, what does that mean? Let's take a look at a couple of example days. So May 19th, 2013, Two of the algorithms estimated maximum hail size of one to one and a quarter inch diameter, and one of them estimated three inches in diameter. So if you received a report of three inch hail at a property, would your conclusions about that claim be different than if you received a report that claimed one inch hail at that property? My guess is that your answer is yes. Uh, three inch hail produces significantly more damage than one inch hail. So my own evaluation of this date indicated a maximum hail size of about one and a quarter inch diameter at this property. So you may be thinking, okay, so two of those algorithms were actually pretty good. In this case, CoreLogic and Verisk um, agreed pretty closely with the professional assessment. All right, so we'll go with them. Weather guidance is just out to lunch. We're not going to use weather guidance. Okay, hold that thought. Let's take a look at another date. May 1st, 2008. On this particular date, CoreLogic and Verisk, that performed pretty well on May 19th, 2013, completely missed the fact that there was hail at all. They showed no hail in the vicinity of this property. In fact, baseball size hail was reported just one mile away, and the core of that storm passed over the insured property. So the only algorithm that even indicated hail at all, and it was vastly undersized, was weather guidance. So in this case, the algorithm that performed poorly on May 19th, 2013, performed significantly better than the competitors on May 1st, 2008, and vice versa. So that means the bottom line is that no one algorithm is perfect. No one algorithm is, is better than the others. I can't tell you, hey, go out and just purchase algorithms, just purchase 
hail reports from, from company X, but not from company Y. The reality is that they're all using and ingesting the same data um, and analyzing it in slightly different ways. But those slightly different analyses can produce vastly different outputs and conclusions. And so the bottom line is that hail algorithms can usually identify storms that are capable of producing hail in the vicinity of a given location. So in the vicinity of an insured property. Often they can identify whether those storms are producing severe hail or not. So they can tell the difference between small sub-severe hail and large hail that's likely to cause damage. Sometimes they even identify the general size range that's reaching the surface in the general vicinity. So um, sometimes these, these algorithms are pretty decent um, at being able to differentiate between sub-severe hail and severe hail near the surface. But rarely can they identify the precise size hail impacting a given location or a given property. So all that being said, what are they good for? They're good for the vast majority, they're, they're okay for the vast majority of, of claims. So this bell curve here represents, you know, the types of claims that you're likely to see and that big green chunk in the middle, that's the majority of claims. They're typical straightforward claims. And all the evidence is pointing in the same direction. So you have clear signs of damage of a type that's covered by a policy. Um, that damage uh, appears to come within the policy period. And the data loss is decently well established. If that's the case, go ahead, pull one of these reports, see what they say. Use it as one more piece of evidence in a well established case. Where you want to proceed with extreme caution is on the tails of the distribution. So these, these orange areas where you have complex claims. So maybe that's a large loss. Maybe it's something where the date of loss is uncertain, or is it a hurricane or was it a severe local storm? Because obviously that makes a pretty big difference in terms of the deductible that's going to be charged or that's going to apply. Um, maybe there's signs of damage outside of the policy period that predates the policy, or perhaps the policy um, was not renewed and there's very recent damage. Uh, or maybe there's just a lack of any observable damage at all. In those cases, you don't want to rely on one of these reports to make a conclusion. That's when you want to bring in a professional meteorologist who's going to be able to look at the entire situation in context and to take into account the nuance and the strengths um, and the uncertainties within the data. Because what, what I as a meteorologist do, what other forensic meteorologists do is is take a look at the whole, it's a big picture approach, right? It's not just a one size fits all algorithm approach. So we're gonna look at the storm structure and evolution. We're going to look at atmosphere profiles to estimate the melting potential. We're going to look at on the ground storm reports. And if it's available, we're gonna look at damage surveys. And then finally, we're gonna put it together in a litigation ready report. So um, if, if we're asked, well, why, why you know one and a half inch hail? If the question why one and a half inch hail is asked of one of these automated reports is going to be well, like that's, that's what the box spit out. I don't know. Um, if you have a professional meteorologist, a forensic meteorologist who makes that assessment, we're going to be able to tell you exactly why we came to the conclusion that you know say one and a half inch hail was what actually fell at that property. So. That's the end of the hail portion. Um, I actually have a there's we're kind of doing okay on time. Um, I don't know if anyone on the chat wants to jump in. Do you would anybody like to see a little bit about wind or uh, if we have a lot of questions for this part, we can just go straight to questions. So I haven't seen any questions coming through. Um, but oh, you're I muted, Cindy. I'm not. Are, can, you can't hear me. Can you hear me? I can hear you, Cindy. Oh, okay. You can hear me now? Okay, weird. I can. Megan, can you hear Cindy? Yes, yes, we're good. Okay. Okay, okay yay. Yeah. So we haven't really gotten a ton of um, questions, but I do have a couple that occurred to me along the way, and then we could certainly talk about wind because um, that was one of my questions. Um, <laughs> so I will give us a beautiful segue, but it, it sounds like... Um, I guess my first question is, why do we primarily rely on radar? Is that the best thing that's available? Is the only thing that's available? Is there better technology coming? Um, yes. So radar coverage, radar gives you good spatial coverage everywhere, right? Our, like I mentioned before, we have holes in the radar network. There are definitely locations where we don't have very good low level coverage 
of radar. And there are places where we don't have any coverage of radar, but the vast majority of the country is covered to some extent by this WSR-88D radar network. Whereas storm reports, um, that, that would be the only other option would just be on the ground storm reports of people saying, hey, there was hail at my house. And those sorts of reports are, are known to be biased towards population centers, right? It's, it's like the, if a tree falls in the forest and no one's there to hear it, doesn't make a sound. You know, if hail falls in a field and no one's there to report it, did it actually happen? And so radar can help us say yes. You know, we can look at the radar data and say there was a storm, um, hail is indicated aloft, the environmental conditions are such that we would not expect that size hail to melt before it reaches the surface. You know, hail capable of causing damage likely impacted this field in the middle of nowhere that no one reported. So that's, that's mainly why we use the radar data. Cool, awesome. And um, I think I understand more about radar than I, I mean, I watched you know, the AccuWeather and I had no idea what we were looking at. So yeah. here we are. Um, and then it sounded to me like you were actually saying the government data is maybe a little more reliable or at least more scientifically validated than private company data. I'm wondering if that, you showed data going all the way back to 2008. We're insurance people. We understand the law of large numbers. Is that data going to get better? So... It is a true statement that the government data are more well validated than the private companies. The problem is that I can't actually tell you how much more accurate or less accurate the, the proprietary algorithms of private companies are versus government algorithms because there haven't been any rigorous studies done on the proprietary algorithms. All we can do is look at similar algorithms for which we do have the data and say, okay, there are fundamental limitations, right? Some of those limitations are the radar itself, the, you know, the resolution of the radar, the, the update cycle, you know, it updates like every five minutes, um, you know, the fact that it can't see below view of the beam. Some of those are, you know, limitations that are basically due to the nature of a storm itself. It's a chaotic environment. So um, there, I, you know, I would argue that there are fundamental limits to what an algorithm can do, that it's never gonna be perfect. But I would love to see data coming from these private companies where they actually do a peer reviewed study and then publish the data about the accuracy and the precision of their own algorithms. Because all we have to go off of is what has been done um, with these National Weather Service algorithms. But I will say the National Weather Service, they are charged with protecting life and property. So they have a real incentive to make their algorithms as good as they possibly can be. Awesome. All right. And then my third question, I think we could spend about 10 minutes on wind. I was curious, how does this work for wind hazards and what kind of data points are available? All right. That's a good segue. Let's, let's back out of this. I have like a, a hidden wind section <laughs> for if we, um, if we get to it. So we did. All right. So the reason that I focused on hail rather than wind is because there's more science behind hail. So I don't know uh, how Thank many you. of you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Hi. Okay. I'll yeah, we it. have somebody who's not muted, so we need everybody to mute. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. Um, so I don't know how many of you have seen the Princess Bride movie, but we have uh, the fantasy of wishful thinking as the rodent of unusual size versus uh, the reality of a neutral. So these wind reports, and you may have seen them, it looks a lot like the hail reports. So it's got you know, location down to, in this case, a single foot. And then you actually look at, you know, the, the estimates for wind and they'll be down to say a single mile an hour, 69 miles an hour. So the question is like, are the data to support this? Are the data that are being ingested into this algorithm, do they support being able to draw a conclusion down to a single mile an hour? And the reality is no. <laughs> Um, there's no, so in the same way, we have like a sort of a semi-universal hail signature, right? So you look for, you know, a deep, um, robust precipitation core high up in the storm and you want alongside that, that precipitation core in the hail growth region, you want to be able to have dual polarization data that indicate that there's actually hail up there and you want to be able to scan the volume of the storm from the top to the bottom and you want to be able to see the hail is 
is reaching all the way to at least the bottom of where the radar is able to see to suggest that hail is likely reaching the ground. So we have hail signatures, radar hail signatures. There's not really great radar wind signatures. So the radar has a, a wind variable. It's called, uh, we're looking at a radial velocity. And what that is, is basically just the component of the wind going directly towards or away from the radar itself. And so if wind is perpendicular to the radar, the radar is not actually able to detect it. It only can detect the component going towards and away. And so that is sufficient to say locate rotation within a thunderstorm. Depending on the orientation of a line of storms, it can be enough to show pockets of strong wind within the storm. But it's not sufficient to tell you, you know, that it was 69 mile an hour wind at this location versus 59 mile an hour wind at that location. So straight line winds come in a couple of different flavors and the way the wind is produced is different. So you end up with what you see over here on the far left, squall lines or bow echoes, or for those of you who were paying attention to Iowa last year, deray shows. What you see here is the wind, the outflow is generally gonna be perpendicular to this line of storm. So it's gonna be blowing out perpendicular to that line. And these are generally more long lived wind events. Um, radar can generally do a better job of detecting strong winds within these sorts of systems, assuming that you have coverage in a way that aligns with the wind field. So you're not ending up with just one radar and the wind is blowing you know, directly perpendicular to it. Um, you can also look at storm structure to, to estimate, to look at the structure of the storm and say, okay, this is the type of storm that tends to produce strong winds. The other way that you get strong winds is through a downburst or a microburst. These tend to be a lot harder to forecast. There's not a lot of lead time. There are some things that you can look at um, in, in radar data to sort of anticipate a downburst. Uh, you can look at, in this case, you know, this graphic here is showing what you're looking at. You look at a, a precipitation core that starts to descend. So you have all this rain pooled air high up in the storm. The updraft weakens and that starts to fall down to the surface. When it hits the ground, it has nowhere to go but out. And so that's when you end up with a downburst. And if you have a radar really close, or you have a, a location that's close to a radar, you can actually see that, that divergent signature on the radar. But for, especially for locations farther from the radar, you're not going to have necessarily a radar indicator of a downburst. What you're going to be relying on in that case is, is damage reports on the ground. So the, the challenge here, again, is really the, the scale of the wind phenomenon versus the the coverage. So we have direct detection using radar, which like I mentioned, uh, radial velocity, but that's plagued by the same sort of issues that we have for, or the, the not plagued, I mean, you have the same constraints that you do for hail. So resolution decreases with distance, the beam height increases with distance. And then I mentioned before that there are locations where we just don't have good coverage. Um, what you're looking at here is all of the uh, NEXTRAD radars, those WSR 88D radars, where you see light uh, yellow, that's where the radar coverage goes all the way down to, or is from the ground level up to about 4,000 feet. 6,000 feet is, you know, up to 6,000, 4 to 6,000 feet is that orange color. And then where you see the, the gray shading, that's where the coverage is only uh, down to about 10,000 feet. And where you see white, there's no coverage at all. So, I mean, some of these are locations that are really prone to severe weather. So you look down here in Southern Oklahoma, Texas, Louisiana and Arkansas, up here in Missouri. These are locations that are prone to severe weather where the radar coverage doesn't extend below 10,000 feet. And so when I talk about like downburst signatures, and, you know, the wind comes down and then it, it diverges at the surface, that outflow doesn't have to, is not very thick often. It's certainly not 10,000 feet thick. So when you have a location far from the radar, all of that can be happening below view of the radar. So the best case is something like this. Um, in this case, we have a, a lost location that's quite close to a radar. In this case, it's a terminal Doppler radar located near an airport. And that radar beam is about 4,000 or 4,000, about 400 feet above the ground. In this case, we have a thunderstorm 
that starts to collapse. And as it does so, you actually see that diverging pattern. So green is towards the radar, red is away from the radar, the radar adheres to the south, so the bottom of the image. Um, and you see this, di this divergence. And then you can take a look at the radar data and compare it to storm reports. So we have a radar signature saying like 40 to 45 knots um, of that, that outbound, that red wind. Did it cause any damage? And we, in fact, as a populated area, we do. We see damage, uh, several trees that were reported down, and then a, a weather station that was actually fairly far, far from this downburst location measured winds up to 40 miles an hour. So like, this, is, this is the best case. Um, and some algorithms have been developed. Um, again, these are with the National Weather Service. So the damaging downburst prediction and detection algorithm was developed by the National Severe Storms Labs to help National Weather Service forecasters anticipate downburst. So this was specifically designed to look at the sort of pulse storms. So those thunderstorms where uh, they're not long lived, they're sort of thunderstorms that's typical here in Florida, summertime storm, you know, a lifetime of maybe an hour goes up, comes down, but they can still produce damaging downbursts. And so this algorithm looked at a couple dozen different radar variables and actually looked at which one of those variables, which combination of those variables actually has the best predictive capability. And under the best case scenario, the, the skill was not very good. It was about, uh, it's called the Heideke skill score. But basically the correct number of correct forecasts divided by the total forecast, once you account for sort of the correct hits that would be expected by chance, it's about 40%. Um, so 40% accurate at detecting um, downbursts. And, the, and that was only close to the radar. That was like within 45 kilometers of the radar. Uh, once you got farther away, uh, more than 45 kilometers away, um, the skill was, was even less. And so the, there's also an, another algorithm called the Haboob algorithm that's out in Arizona. They use it to, to warm for dust storms. But those are, are two algorithms that have actually been developed and that have been reviewed for accuracy. And um, their skill is not great. And uh, you know, kind of as the same that I mentioned with the hail algorithms, the proprietary hail algorithms, um, we don't have the sort of verification validation studies of the proprietary algorithms. So another way that we can detect wind is through weather stations. So there's a couple, there's several different types of weather stations. The ASOS or AWOS stations, these are the ones that tend to be co-located with airports. So they're standardized in terms of siding. They're not nestled up against trees. They're in nice open fields. The instrumentation is all standardized, the type of equipment, the type of measurements that are being taken. Uh, so these are, are really reliable. It's an apple to apples comparison when you're, we're looking at these stations. But they're generally only located at airports. So they can, there can be quite a bit of spacing in between these stations and thunderstorms you know, are, can, be, can be pretty small phenomenon. So we can also look at personalized weather stations. Um, I have one outside my office. Many of you probably have these weather stations as well. So those are useful in that they tend, there's a higher density, they are uh, more common, but the challenge here is that they're not standardized. So um, you don't necessarily know what the siding is. I mean, I'll use mine as an example. We get good rain, um, but there's so many trees around here that even during Hurricane Irma, the maximum gust was like 25 miles an hour. I will never have reliable wind data from this weather station but somebody who hasn't seen it, someone who say is trying to pull data from it is not necessarily going to know that. So if they just say, oh, well, this was a non-event because this one weather station in Gainesville, Florida said, you know, 25 mile an hour winds. That's a, that's a, a result of the sighting of where this weather station is. So these personal weather stations can be useful, but you have to kind of approach them with caution. And then these sorts of, uh, station measurements are only relevant if the same storm impacted a weather station as impacted whichever location or property you're interested in. And then finally, um, there's indirect detection. So these are the damage reports. Uh, these will come in from uh, so National Weather Service local storm reports. These will come in from citizens, um, emergency managers, emergency responders, fire departments, they're moving trees and they're telling the National Weather Service, hey, there's a giant tree down and we're moving it. Um, meteorologists, off-duty meteorologists in the media will also submit these storm reports. As a citizen, 
You all can submit these further reports as well through an app called MPING, which is a collaboration with University of Oklahoma and the National Weather Service. Um, and that's a great resource. So I encourage anybody who is a weather geek like myself or just wants to contribute to science to download the MPING app and submit weather reports when you have damaging weather that you observe. And then finally, we have damage surveys. So if you ha have a, basically, if you have a report of damage, you can look at that damage and from that damage estimate the maximum wind speed. So this is how, um, the, this is from the enhanced Fujita scale. So when you have a, a tornado, people weren't out there with like an am anemometer measuring the wind speed, it's based on damage. And so research on what strength of wind does it take to break limbs off of a tree or to remove shingles from a roof. And there'll be a range of values and based on that um, and looking at different types of damage within an area, you can narrow down or constrain a wind speed estimate. So that's, that's wind. All right, amazing. What was, the, I love the idea of the community science aspect. Yeah. I, I'm a um, certified naturalist and we do the same thing. We take pictures of like lizards in our backyards yeah. and then go send them in. So yeah. what was what was the name of the app again? It's called MPing. I'm actually going to try to bring this up on my phone and I'll hold it up so you guys can see <laughs> what the what the little icon looks like. All right, can y'all? It looks like that's like not even good. Yeah, there you go. All right. Okay. So it's so called M Ping. The letter M, M as in Megan, um, and P I N G, and it Got uses. It. Um, it's, it's great. Anytime if you have, I mean, people, you can report just rain, um, different wind speeds. So it uses what you observe. It's not going to ask you to estimate wind speed. It's like, is your trash can getting blown around? Did a large, um, branch fall, um, for hail? It'll ask, you know, for a hail size estimate, that sort of thing, but that's really useful data. And the National Weather Service uses that to verify their forecast, but also to refine, you know, to know when they were off and to better That's understand. So cool. I, I never even knew there was such a thing. I put MPing in the chat. So if anybody's interested, I was trying to find it on the app store, but I was uh, in, uh, using the wrong initial. I was going with N instead of M. So yeah, I, yeah. so pretty cool. <laughs> I think we probably need to wrap up, although I could listen to this all day and I, I, I've heard from some other uh, attendees kind of along the same lines. So I can't tell you how much I appreciate you, Megan, for agreeing to spend time with us today about understanding all these emerging technologies and how they're useful in the insurance industry. This webinar has been recorded. It'll be posted to the Sila Foundation website so you can share it with members of your team who might also be interested. All of you will be receiving a post-webinar survey, so be sure and fill that out. Provide your candid feedback so we can help improve these programs going forward. Silo Foundation provides these webinars free of charge. It's part of our mission and outreach. If you learned something of value today, please consider a personal or corporate donation to the foundation. We rely on donations and sponsorships to keep programs like these webinars going. If your company might be interested in sponsoring a future webinar, let me or Mary Ellen Hammock know. Speaking of future webinars, I don't actually have one to announce for next week because we will all be seeing each other, I hope, at our upcoming annual conference this year, live and in person in Philadelphia, September 19th to 22nd, if you haven't registered yet. Take care of that today, and we will look forward to seeing you all uh, in Philly. Thank you so much for joining us today, and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.